Hi, and welcome back to the Shane Plays uh, White Plume Mountain note series from Tales from the Awning Portal, the, um, the collection of adventures. Uh, they took a bunch of classic adventures and updated them in the 5th edition and been having a great time. So if you're new to the series, thanks so much for watching. If you've been keeping up with the series, thanks for watching again. Uh, there was a gap of a week uh, because I was ill uh, for one week. And uh, so there was, if you're like, hey, it's been a while, well, that's why. And it actually happened about a month ago. So um, anyway, moving forward, had, a, had another fun session, last session. We'll talk about that. And, uh, you know, I'll update some notes like I normally do. We'll go into some D&D &D rules and all that, all that good stuff. But uh, main thing to remember is, is that uh, my group is having fun with this adventure. So I'm really glad we chose it. Now. Uh, when we ended last session in video, they were in the terraced aquarium room where Black Razor is at the bottom in a kind of a room underneath the terraced aquarium, and they had just begun going in. So uh, that was sort of the, the cliffhanger we ended on, and I'll get into that here in a moment. But of course, we've got viewer mail, so I have to put on my plus three spectacles of viewer feedback and let's take a look at what people had to say via the YouTube comments. So, um, all right. So Nathan Kelly said, and, and we talked about, there was a couple of uh, videos we've, we've talked about gender a little bit and, you know, gender being different from sex and then, um, how it applies maybe to a fantasy world versus the real world and that sort of thing. And he just said, Hey, since you talked about gender issues, have you thought about how some demons do not have normal anatomy? There are many and androgynous or gender ambiguous demons. Some do not have any parts at all. Uh, just thought it might be interesting to your out of the abyss players and watchers. So he's talking about, cause we're, we're playing white blue mountain in between part one and part two of out of the abyss. The reason I thought about it is because the third edition fiendish codex actually had addressed the anatomy, the anatomy of demons and devils. And there are also the demons and devils that definitely fall into a typical gender role, like the Grazit, I guess I'm saying that right, or the Merilith. So the thing is, uh, demons and devils, and uh, there's a lot of monsters and creatures in D&D &D and fantasy in general. Pardon me, i am still got a little bit of the old <coughs> right there, so I apologize that. I'll probably cut some of that out. Um, there's in, in fantasy, D and D and fantasy in general, there are a lot of monsters, creatures, races, whatever that do not conform to the normal, you know, uh, biological norms that, that, you know, we know of, but it's been established both in D and D and fantasy and what that most races, humans definitely included, you know, have a, have a, a male and female sex. But Nathan brings up a good point, but that doesn't mean that, you know, all, all of these different creature types and, and whatever that you can encounter, uh, either from the prime material plane or other planes of existence in D and D have to follow that mold. So that's a good point. And I may play with that a little bit when we get into the out of the abyss. Um, Nathan, so thanks for writing in on that. So, Wield Adventure wrote in on um, talking about the frictionless floor, which was actually a couple of videos back, but uh, they commented on, on video number three, so I'll go ahead and address it here. They said, my group tried multiple tricks trying to cross the frictionless floor, but each attempt resulted in them landing in the pit. One made an entertaining attempt to surf on his shield across and leap off when he reached the ledge, but failed to check to stay on. That's actually not a bad idea because you're absolutely frictionless when you're on the, that floor from that area. And it's that room where there's this frictionless area. The floor ceiling walls are completely frictionless. And there's these two pits at either end that you sort of automatically plummet into. And they have these rusty blades at the bottom that can cut you and also give you super tetanus so it's a good point. If you do it on your shield and you, and the shield is zipping across, I guess you could try to jump off the shield because we established that it's so frictionless that you can't, you know, be zooming down 
the, um, the frictionless floor and then jump off the floor because there's no friction to grasp against to, to jump. But I guess on your shields you could do that. But in a uh, wheeled adventurer's case, the commoner um, failed to check to stay on the on the shield, I guess, and, and leap across. So what they ended up doing was the cleric stayed in the pit, healing other party members as they fell in and climbed out. Not a very elegant solution, but they definitely tried a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I it works. If it works, it works. You know, this is a lot of White Plume Mountain, this trap included, or this challenge included, is about problem solving. And that, that works as well. If you can get the cleric in there and they're, you know, in a, in a place where they're safe and people fall in, they can heal them. Why not? I mean, it works for me. And I did, I, I, I did ask this. I didn't want to get super tetanus. And uh, Wheeled Adventure said, yeah, one person failed to save, but the cleric used restoration on him the same round. Glad they brought a devoted healer along. Haha. <laughs> well, definitely. This is an old school dungeon. So you want an old school party mix, in my opinion. You know, I talked about that in one of my previous videos of my party. I encouraged them to really have a, um, a, uh, you know, good palette. You know, you got your fighter, you got your rogue or thief, um, you got your cleric, you know, you got your wizard, uh, whatever. You know, you want to have that party balance for these, for this type of dungeon. And that old school D&D &D was definitely that way. Uh, Pax Paul wrote in, and uh, he kind of continued the conversation on the gender issues. And there is a, um, he left a comment uh, saying anybody wants to know more. I think he was providing it to me, but I'm just saying anybody wants to know more. There's some research, some like sort of scientific research and stuff like that. He posted a link to nature.com if people want to read a little bit more on, on that topic. Um, okay, Rob Plummer uh, said, Laugh out loud, just get moving. Oh boy, Shane. He's talking about where I was talking about bringing a cow into a dungeon. And uh, I made a let's get moving uh, bad joke. So glad you enjoyed. I'm assuming you enjoyed that, Rob. But I love a bad joke very, very much. And a bad pun is one of my favorite things in all the world. Um, Rob Plummer also mentioned, he says, I've run into the assisting bug as well. I ruled that if it was a thing that an individual must do alone, then there can be no assist. I did the same as your fellow DM and made them explain what they are doing to assist. So what we're talking about here, as I mentioned last video, I kind of cracked down a little bit of my party. Like anytime somebody was searching or doing survival or picking a tr you know, lock or looking for traps or would dis disabling a trap, somebody else would go, I'm assisting. And then they were, everybody was constantly getting advantage. So I kind of cracked down on that. You know, I was like, I said, unless it's an unusual circumstance, you know, for your standard search for traps or, you know, try to unlock the door or, you know, doing a survival check or whatever. I said, we're not just going to be constantly assisting. I said, there'll be some cases where I allow it. And, you know, and then we'll explain how is this person assisting. The thing is, rules is written. The assist rules I, I feel can be abused, especially since they give advantage, which is, is a very powerful mechanic in this game. Advantage, you get to roll two dice and pick the best of the two. It's a very powerful advantage, no pun intended. So I've cracked down on it. And, um, you know, I'd recommend other DMs do as well, but of course, play however you want. Um, let's see here. Don... And Don, I apologize. I feel like I'm going to mispronounce your last name. Rome? Romy? Don Romy? I'll go with that. Uh, great video as always. I just ordered the book. Can't wait to play it out. I love listening to how other people will handle the situation. Yeah, that, I love that too. It's like, it's fascinating to see how different parties or different players will handle the exact same thing. So I'm really enjoying the walkthroughs. Keep up the great work. Can't wait for the next one. I, I'm glad you're enjoying them, Don. I really enjoy doing them, and I get a lot of positive feedback, so thank you so much. Uh, Rob Plummer also said, Black Razor is a super powerful sentient weapon. Can't wait to see how you play this out with whoever picks it up. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, I, I, I established at the beginning of White Plume Mountain, uh, the very first video where I kind of set everything up. I thought it was kind of dumb for them to go in and do all those hard work and get these great weapons just to go turn them over to somebody else 
so then that person could reward them with, with their heart's desire. I was like, I'll just let them keep the weapons. And I'm familiar with these weapons from throughout the years, but I hadn't really gone and read up on them at that point in a while. They are pretty powerful. They're also sentient. So I'm not at this point going to change my, um, you know, thought that I'm not going to let them have, the, I'm going to let them have the weapons if they earn them, if they go through everything and get them. But the fact that they're sentient is going to come into play. And they, these weapons have wheels of their own. And I'm going to let alignment come into play. I mean, Black Razor steals people's souls and gives the, the wielder hit points and power based on literally eating the souls of other people. I can't see a good character using Black Razor unless it was an emergency. I can't see them using that as their weapon of choice. So there's going to be some interesting role-playing with these weapons. One, because they're very powerful. They're almost artifact level in some ways. They're definitely legendary weapons. But two, they have their own personalities. Uh, I believe, if I remember right, uh, Whelm, which is the Warhammer, like wants to be wielded by a dwarf. So it could be interesting to see if a non-dwarf tries to wield Whelm. Uh, and then, you know, um, uh, there's Whelm Wave, the Trident, has its own thing going on. So I'm, it's going to be interesting. It's going to lead to some some interesting role-playing. And like I said, I'm going to, I'm, I'm a fan of the alignment system, as I've said in other videos, because I feel that the D&D world, Forgotten Realms, whatever, Dragonlance, all these other worlds, alignment isn't just some sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, relative morality system. There are cosmic forces behind the alignment system, and there's deities and all this, that, and the other. And I like that aspect of D&D, &D, and I always have. I understand this, uh, some people hate alignment. F good. You don't have to use it. You don't. You can still enjoy D&D &D without it. I like it. And I like characters to establish what their alignment is, and then if they deviate from that, that it can lead to some interesting role-playing. Um, not the least of which, the first thing I'll do is if somebody's consistently playing against their alignment, not just one time, but consistently, I'll start giving them disadvantage on everything because they're out of balance in themselves until they address it. Until they go, why am I getting disadvantage on everything? And then, it, you know, I'll either have them have a dream or, or something to figure out what's going on. Okay, Tony Dutra, who's a personal buddy of mine and uh, runs the best GURPS games around and uh, is, is also works with uh, Steve Jackson Games as a rep. Uh, great guy. He chimed in. He's been playing role-playing games forever. Uh, he chimed in and said half-elves have been affected by undead paralysis since AD&D First Edition when the quote-unquote race was first introduced. So what he's talking to is there was some discussion, I think like ghouls, elves and undead are immune to ghoul paralysis. And we've, you know, we've had some discussion here on these videos and in the channel like, well, are half-elves? And I, I've been kind of leaning towards no, because I don't see anything in the write-up on half-elves that would indicate that they're immune. And the the monster stab block says elves, not half-elves. So I've been leaning that way, and, and Tony also agrees. And I know, I think Rob Plummer, somebody, I know somebody else chimed in on that, and they, and they felt the same thing. So thanks, Tony, for commenting. Um, Tony also made an interesting uh, observation um, on the the gender issue. He said, in GMing terms, DMGM, uh, gender identification would be a quirk on the player's character sheet. If the character had some rare gender identification, it isn't immediately perceivable to the NPCs in the game. Their actual gender would be, though, and that's the point. Um, so I, what he's saying is, is like if, if somebody wants to play a character that, for example, their sex is male, but they identify as you know male or female or something else because um, all these you know I, I, there's all these different genders out there that people you know there's this big list then what he's saying you could do it as a quirk on the character uh, role-playing but if I walk up and I see somebody whose sex is a male I'm not gonna automatically assume that they're female but if somebody want to role-play it and say well I my character identifies as female and all this other stuff then you know you could kind of lead into some role-playing 
So that's the point he's making. I think that's an interesting point. So James Kyle wrote in. There more, more than one person wrote in about this. So I'm going to go ahead and um, you know spend some time talking about this. This is an interesting rules discussion. Um, James Kyle wrote in on on video number two uh, and said the water pit might pose problems if you're in full plate armor and carrying 50 pounds of we of weapons and gear. So uh, let me see. Somebody else wrote in on this. Let me find it. Oh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, Chris Peterson also wrote in and said on the water pit, and they, and they they're discussing on video too, but I want and I don't normally say well I'll take videos from a previous video and carry them over to another one because we're talking about video three right now in the comments on that. But this is an interesting discussion, so I want to do this. It says uh, it was originally dangerous due to the armor and weight used back in the day. If wearing plate, you sank like a fool and usually had to abandon your plate to the bottom. We had our paladin and drown in it way back in those dark ages. So uh, yeah, so. This is interesting, and I had a player actually mention, uh, and I may I forgot to make a note of it. I was going to mention it last session that they were like, "Oh, well, maybe you know, if you fall in the pit with with armor, it could be a dangerous situation." So, and, that, and in fact, that's the deal because I was like, when we when it first came up, and I'll find the map and uh, the area here. It's area 18 on the map. And it's just a 10-foot square pit that's filled with water. And in that area of the dungeon, the floor is covered by a foot of water. So if you're not paying attention, like, you know, if you're not checking with 10-foot poles or whatever, you could just walk right into the pit and sink. So I was like, what's the deal? And I wasn't thinking in terms of a first edition D&D or AD&D when this adventure was written. So I did some research. Like I said, a player mentioned this. And then, you know, I mentioned the two people that commented on the video, and I was like, ah. So I pulled out um, my handy-dandy first edition books, and um, it, the answer was actually in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And it said, swimming will be impossible. This is on page 55 of the original DMG, AD&D first edition. Swimming will be impossible in any type of metal armor with the exception of magic armor. Any character wearing magic armor will be encumbered and the only stroke possible would be the dog paddle. So basically any type of metal armor, you just, you sink. Boom. And there's rules on suffocation and drowning and how long it takes to get in and out of armor. Uh, so the point is that that section, that little Section 18 could be dangerous if you were in first edition and you were wearing metal armor. You would just boom straight to the bottom. And and basically, uh, in first edition, best I could tell, look it up, you can only hold your breath for your, I think, your constitution score, that amount of rounds. And then after that, you started drowning. Now, the in the basic... Dungeon Master's Guide or the basic, or not the basic, but first edition or the first edition player's handbook. There's not, the, the, the rules on drowning aren't really super clear, but you know, the DM could, well, you know, you're losing hit points every round or, or whatever they could, they could figure it out. Now, I think there was a wilderness survival guide, something like that that came out for first edition. I think it had some deeper rules in it there on underwater, or this or drowning and that sort of thing. But the point is, first edition, if you were in metal armor and you hit that pit, boom, down you went. And you would have to, you know, either people save you or you'd have to take your armor off and, and you know, climb back out. Assuming you could get your armor off in the time before you drowned. Um, you know, and I'd have, I didn't look up the armor on and off times in first edition. Now, I did look them up in fifth edition. Fifth edition... It doesn't say that you can't swim in metal armor. Okay, it says that, you know, the more, the, the heavier your armor is or whatever, you, you take some penalties to movement or dexterity or this, that, or not to movement, to the dexterity and some other stuff and to stealth, uh, but it doesn't prevent you from, from swimming in it. Um, you know, it, they just got rid of that evidently. Um, so interesting you know it's kind of interesting to see the difference between fifth edition 
and first edition. Uh, again, fifth edition or first edition, if you were in that water, you were going down. Um, if you were in metal armor, not just plate, but metal armor, you were you were you were hitting the bottom of the sea or whatever with Davy Jones locker, and that's that was all there was to it. Um, trying to think, I looked up some stuff here in the player's handbook. Let me see if there's anything. Do 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 do. Yeah, there's a. Uh, there's some um, notes in here on swimming and underwater combat that I'll get into later in the video because that actually applies to some of the stuff that was happening in the um, the adventure. So anyway, um, so good points on that pit because it totally baffled me. I was like, what, what what is the point of this pit? You can just jump across it. You can swim across it. Da da da. But First edition, it could have been lethal in a, in a certain situation. And, and as um, Chris Peterson pointed out, uh, their paladin drowned in it way back in the day. So that, that that pit actually claimed one of their party members, you know. So so it's interesting. Same dungeon design, different editions leads to slightly different, different results. So one of these days, I want to run and... At least one adventure, if not a campaign, purely in first edition D&D. Uh, just to see if it's as fun as I remember. Because um, there was something about, like, the dice could kill you quite quickly in first edition. Is that just nostalgia that I remember that fondly? Or is it, you know, is it, is it really an essentially cool part of the game? So one of these days I'm going to try to do that. Uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. So I think that's everything on the um, on the viewer feedback. Yeah, that's it. So I appreciate, as always, uh, that. And, you know, now we're going to talk about what happened on last video. And I'm going to take off my plus three spectacles of viewer feedback. And boom, it's like somebody cast a darkness spell outside. Ah, what do you know? And, and speaking of darkness and light spells, we'll talk about that a little bit here in the video later as we talk about everything that happened in this most recent session. But to recap, the characters, the players, had made it to uh, the Terraced Aquarium, which is the area that has, you know, the top row has the giant crayfish, and the next is the giant scorpions. And then the sea lions in the very bottom is the manticores, or are the manticores. And then there's a little chamber deep down that, that goes to a room, and that, that's where Black Razor is and, and all of that. So uh, in that room, the actual number is 26. Is it 25 or 26, the terraced aquarium? So they had decided to throw some ropes down like across the giant crayfish area and into uh, the giant scorpions area. And they had all like basically committed themselves to going over the ropes and getting into the, the scorpions area, except for the sorcerer who was holding back to kind of provide artillery support. So that's where they were at. Now I'd given them, and I think I made it fairly straightforward. I didn't even make it that difficult. I think I said, give me a 10, either athletics or acrobatics check, you know, or whatever is relevant for those two, if you don't have those skills. And I just made it a 10 and uh, everybody made it except for the, uh, the cleric, the wood elf cleric. Uh, and the, um, I think it's a high elf cleric and, and, and the, the, gnome wizards mount the dog named houndini had splashed into the water at the top level and the rest were in the scorpions aquarium area terrace level um now one thing I, I made a note of but i forgot to mention is one of my players had said um when the cleric fell in as that happened, said so, and I was and and I was like, okay, you're stuck in there. They said, but I'm holding the rope for that character, and 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 I said, no, no, you're not, because you guys all told me that you were moving rapidly as quick as possible to get to that next level on the ropes, and as soon as you rolled, you committed yourself to that. 
So I didn't, you know, a lot of people are like, but I'm doing this or that to kind of retroactively because somebody else's role went bad. And this isn't a cheater type of player. This is a very mature, good player. Uh, but in this particular case, I ruled against that. I'm like, no, you guys are scrambling down as quick as you can. And everybody said, we're moving as quick as we can. So, because they told me that, I said, well, you know, you're not scrambling down on your own and holding somebody else's rope to somehow make it easier for them to either make it across or to get back out if they fell in. So, just to give more insight on how I DM, um, you know, I, I don't usually allow a lot of that, oh, but I was, you know, and which was never stated until a bad role happened. And then all of a sudden a character or characters, Oh no, no, but we were doing this. No, you didn't tell me that. So now I don't always rule that way. I mean, if the rule of cool comes into play or if it makes some sort of sense game wise, but to just say that to kind of help compensate for somebody's bad role, I, I usually don't, I usually don't go with that. So anyway, uh, they're in the giant scorpions area. Every four characters, five, characters one character and a dog mount are in with a giant crayfish and then one the sorcerers up on the rim looking down to provide artillery support with sorcerer spells so what i had where had we had ended things was two of the giant crayfish were headed their way and then the other four giant crayfish were still headed towards the dancing lights that had been cast about halfway down their level um, I, cause they said they shaped them like people and, and all this as a, so by the rule of cool, I just said, well, you know, for the crayfish are that way. The other two have noticed you splash in and they're, they're like dinner time. And I had decided I'd written this down, but I didn't tell the players this, that the giant scorpions were going to begin engaging on round three. So I had everybody roll initiative. We had it all ready to go. I knew exactly what was going to happen, who had initiative, when the scorpions were going to come in, we, we finished all that at the, at the previous session and we picked up right there. So what basically happened was the, uh, the surprising things, because obviously they're going to go into combat and all that, that Houndini, the dog mount who only had five hit points became giant crayfish chow. I, I have no other way to put it, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the gnome wizard player was like, Oh, how nini. And I told them, I said, look, I'm not, I'm not glad that your dog is dead. You know, your imaginary game dog, obviously, if somebody's real dog died, I'd be distraught. I said, but you, you brought a dog, not even a familiar, which is like a, a familiar is a spirit that has taken the form of that animal. So it's got like maybe more intelligence or this, that, or the other, maybe more abilities. This is just a dog. And they brought a dog with five hit points into one of the most dangerous and famous dungeons in D and D history. So what I told the player was, I'm not glad that your dog is dead. I am, however, not surprised in the least. And I even kind of hinted around the previous session. I'm like, you brought a dog. And I was like, Oh, this dog isn't really happy to be in here. Now I had no designs to kill the dog, but the dog died. So long story short, the giant crayfish attacked. And the, the cleric, I think either took minimum damage or didn't take any damage, but the dog died. And the sorcerer was trying to cast like fire spells on the crayfish. And then the sorcerer started get, taking ranged spiked attack damage from the mana cores because they didn't know that the mana cores were down there. I had been very clear to say, well, not clear. I'd been clear to say that what was in the bottom tier, what, it wasn't clear what was down there. There's just something down there. Because I wanted the, the ranged attack from the mana cores to be a surprise. So, and the, and the, and the sorcerer, you know, made good use of the shield spell a couple of times. Uh, I think took a little bit of damage cause I was rolling well for the mana cores, but it didn't take as much damage as they could have. Um, another thing I want to point out at this moment is underwater combat. 
because I had to look that up, obviously, for this room. And let me see if I can find it here. All right, so here's how underwater, underwater combat works. Um, when making a melee attack, a creature that doesn't have swimming speed, either natural or granted by magic, has disadvantage on the attack roll unless the weapon is a dagger, javelin, short sword, spear, or trident. A ranged weapon attack automatically misses a target beyond the weapon's normal range. Even against a target within normal range, the attack roll has disadvantage unless the weapon is a crossbow, a net, or a weapon that is thrown like a javelin, including a spear, trident, or dart. Creatures and objects that are fully immersed in water have resistance to fire damage. So those are basically the 5e rules for underwater combat. I ruled, I went ahead and applied those to the cleric that was fighting the giant because she's kind of in the water, splashing around. The water is deeper than she is tall. These tiers are 10 feet tall. So I applied, other than she didn't have resistance to fire damage because she wasn't completely underwater. Other than that, I had everything else apply. Another thing I want to mention for um, swimming, uh, when climbing or swimming, and this is on page 182 in the player's handbook, the, the underwater combat rules are in 198, but in 182, while climbing or swimming, each foot of movement costs one extra foot um, or two extra feet in difficult terrain unless the creature has climbing or swimming speed. So basically it's double the cost to swim unless you have... Um, you know, some sort of ability or, or spell or whatever that lets you swim, like the grants you swim movement. Uh, also, gaining any distance in rough water might require a successful strength athletics check. And then suffocating, I didn't mention this for 5e. Um, oh, I have that here. Dang it, all my stuff keeps disappearing on me. I had all this stuff marked. Where did it go? Um... Basic, yeah, here it is, suffocating, page 183. A creature can hold its breath. This is 5e. Remember, in first edition, I think some of the other editions, it's the constitution score that many of rounds. But in 5e, a creature can hold its breath for a number of minutes equal to one plus its constitution modifier, not its score, but its modifier, and a minimum of 30 seconds. When a creature runs out of breath, it can survive for a number of rounds equal to its constitution modifier, minimum of one round. At the start of its next turn, it drops to zero hit points and is dying. And then there's some errata here on the player's handbook that I printed out right after it first came out. Your edition of the player's handbook may already have this corrected, but it says, uh, page 183, suffocating, if you run out of breath, you can't regain hit points or be stabilized until you can breathe again. So once you start suffocating, you can't be healed. Somebody can't throw hit points on you through healing or whatever. You can't drink a healing potion. Um, and you can't be stabilized in, until uh, you're, you know, basically, um, what's it say? You can't or be stabilized until you can breathe again. So once you start drowning... You've either, they've either got to get you out of the water or they got to get a spell on you or a potion or something that lets you breathe underwater. One of the two. So, um, just wanted to point that out. I, I don't think this part of the adventure, that those rules are really going to come into play. But as long as we're talking about being in the water and fighting, I thought it would be a good time um, to, to point those out. So, the, uh, the crayfish, after the blood got in the water from the dog... Bo started eating the dog, uh, and and the and the gnome wizard was like, "You're welcome," you know, to everybody very sardonically. Um, and I gave the uh, cleric a chance to climb out, and I think I made it because now it's like, "Oh, there's oh, I gotta get out of here." There's monsters and all that. I made it a a DC 12 athletics or acrobatics check. They made it and got down to the next level. So now everybody's in. Um, Except for the sorcerer, everybody's in the next tier down with the scorpions, who, remember, I've said are going to come in on round three of the combat. I just, I think I just arbitrarily decided that. 
um, you know, they're, they're kind of like, hey, something's going on. So they're kind of starting to head that way, see what's going on over there. It's feeding time, whatever. Really, I, I don't expect the players to fight all the scorpions, and they didn't. But it's a, it's a nice device to give that sense of urgency. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. Now, there's going to be parties out there that want to fight and kill everything that's on every level of the terrorist aquarium. That's fine. I mean, different parties. There's going to be parties that, that find ways around it. There's, they're going to cast flight, and they're all going to fly down to the bottom level. Um, some are going to smash out the aquarium walls and let the water drain out. I mean, there's, you know, there's a multiple ways to go about this. What the party that I'm DMing through did, they went for the direct approach. They threw ropes, and they just kept going. They just kept going trying to make it down as quick as they could. Now, the sorcerers started getting into a, uh, a fireball uh, artillery exchange with the mana cores, and the mana cores were still shooting, you know, uh, their tail spikes at the sorcerer up there on the rim. And in the area, the terraced area, with the scorpions, where the, the majority of characters were at, they started working to climb up the glass wall that led to the next area with the uh, sea lions. So they were like using like ropes and grappling hooks and this and that and the other to climb up and straddle that, that glass wall, not going completely over it, but just kind of straddling it up at the top. So, you know, hopefully the scorpions couldn't get to them and all this stuff. And I allowed that for the rule of cool, but yeah, sure, why not? That's kind of neat. It's kind of an Indiana Jones exciting scene where you're straddling this wall. There's all these monsters around. Plus, to be honest, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this room. There's a lot of other dungeons to explore. So if they can find a fairly quick way through it that doesn't involve a lot of combat, that's fine with me. And, you know, D&D &D can be so combat-oriented that I'm actually pleased with my players that they were not trying to fight and kill everything just because of their XP or whatever, you know, they're big buckets of XP. Let's kill them and get the XP. You know, they were just, Hey, let's get down there quick. Let's try to get around all this stuff. Totally fine with that. Another thing that happened was, um, the gnome wizard. She also has a familiar, um, named Barney. I think Barnabas, the owl, and she sent her owl down sort of on this dive bomb run. I, I guess there's an ability, uh, I'd have to go look it up for the exact name, but you can extend a spell, like a range touch spell through a familiar, or not a range touch, but a touch spell through a familiar. And she had the owl sort of fly down in the very bottom tier and drop a light spell, and it was almost like a dive bomb, and then come back up. And reading the light spell later, I probably shouldn't have allowed it because you're supposed to cast light onto something that has to be, I think, a maximum 10 foot big. She didn't cast it on the mana cores. <clears throat> she just cast it, and I allowed it. Didn't even think to double check that. But reading up on it later, because I had to look into darkness spells versus light spells, which we'll get to here in a second, I was like, oh, probably shouldn't have allowed that. But they did have some... Uh, I think little pebbles and stuff that they'd cast light on. So, you know, we could have very easily just said that the owl flew down and dropped one of those. Either way, right? So then they're like, oh, mana cores, because they were guessing they were mana cores, but they weren't sure. And, uh, you know, sure enough, oh, mana cores. So the, uh, the sorcerers, like, blasting... Um, you know, fireballs down there, and they're, they're blasting tail spikes back. And then I think there's a, a rogue that has some arcane trickster kind of stuff, if I remember right. Uh, or I think maybe it was a drow rogue, so maybe it was innate. I think maybe it was innate ability. Either way, a darkness spell got cast down into the bottom tier with the mana cores. <clears throat> so then I had to look up, oh, darkness versus light, and this and that and the other. Basically, darkness <clears throat> will cancel out a... Um, it will cancel out a light spell. So um, let me find it here. I looked that up, and, and I, we knew that at the time. Uh, 
but you know, I was curious in fifth edition, this hadn't come up with me in fifth edition. Does the level of the light spell mean anything? And, um, I, I guess it could, but it says if any of the spells area, talking about darkness overlaps with an area of light created by a spell of second level or lower. So the level matters. The spell that created light is dispelled and they just threw a basic light spell, um, which is a cantrip. So darkness took care of the light and you know, the, the, the character that had thrown the darkness was like, ah, or the light was like, what are you doing? Now we can't see them. But they were trying to get darkness on the mana cores so they would have a disadvantage shooting their tail spikes at. And you have to, you know, the, the bottom area in 20, in area 26, this terraced uh, aquarium, the whole area is 20 by, let's see, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It's 20 by 50. And darkness covers, let me look that darkness spell back up. It, it covers a pretty decent area and darkness will also like ooze around corners and stuff like that. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty effective spell if used in the right, um, circumstances. Here goes darkness. Right. Magical darkness spreads from a point you choose within a range or within range to fill a 15 foot radius sphere for the duration. The darkness spreads around corners. A creature with dark vision can't see through this darkness and non-magical light can't illuminate it. So, um, now this could just be cast on wherever you see. So they chose an area of the floor because <clears throat> they were up straddling the glass wall and they were up on top of it looking down so they could see down in there. And, and the way they did it is they cast it in an area that if, because you could, they could cover most of the bottom tier of area 26 where the mana cores were, except for uh, a, a 20 by 10 area at the very end, closest to the characters. So they made it, so if the mana cores tried to come out of that darkness so they could start seeing, then the angle they would be at you know, they may not be able to uh, get to the characters because it would be too much of an angle to get up to the, where the characters are. So that was pretty clever. Uh, and they very specifically wanted to do it a certain way. So they, uh, the, the main character, the sorcerer character, I think through like three fireballs, you know, even after the darkness got cast, through a couple more fireballs, up to and including burning sorcery points. I mean, they wanted to take these mana cores out. And then um, one of the characters still has the necklace of fireballs from out of the abyss, and they threw a bead down into the darkness. And so, I mean, there were fireballs like boom, 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 just going like crazy in this darkness. And I kind of joked around and said, if there is an evil wizard running this dungeon, he's kind of looking in the crystal ball and he's like, ooh, ow, ooh, ow, you know, kind of like, ooh, that's just cold. And, um, you know, because, I mean, they're just, they're not messing around. They're going medieval. They're going Pulp Fiction on these mana cores. Um, so, long story short, if that's possible with me, uh, all of the characters basically manage through various means to get up. And they're tying on ropes to the other ropes to extend the, um, the range of the ropes. And they're casting them. So, they're trying to cast... The ropes, they get up on the glass wall. They're stra straddling the gas glass wall that's in between the scorpion tier and the sea lion tier. And they're casting ropes to get down into um, the very bottom tier where the mana cores are and the darkness. At this point, I'm like, okay, that's cool. And they're, I give them, uh, I, by this point, I'm making it a DC 12, not a DC 10 to get down the ropes. I could have made it harder, but... You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm looking for a good action scene. I'm not looking to kill characters. Um, trying to give them a reasonable chance to move quickly. Again, I'm rewarding them. They don't know this, but I'm rewarding them for not just making it a big combat slog. They're trying to find a way down quickly. And they're only fighting when they have to. So, um, you know, they start one by one kind of making it down into the mana core area. Now, one thing I did... Uh, because they specifically said they were straddling these glass walls. The sea lions, and this is on page 242 of Tales from the Awning Portal. It's in the appendix that has the monsters. 
they have this thing called swimming leap. And it says with a 10 foot swimming start, the sea lion can long jump out of or across the water up to 25 feet. Now that's one of their actions. It doesn't specifically say that it can be combined with an attack, but I decided to go ahead and do that. Now what I did do, because a sea lion can do a multi-attack, okay, they can bite and they can do two claw attacks. So what I did was I combined it and let and let a couple of sea lions kind of leap and do a couple of claw attacks and then splash back into the water. I didn't let them get the bite because I'm sort of fudging with their abilities here, best I can tell. Because I think this leap is just supposed to be a movement thing. I don't think it's supposed to be a move and attack thing. But I thought it was a very nice thing, element to the action scene because, you know, they're straddling these glass walls up at the top and all, and they're like, oh, we're safe up here. And all of a sudden these sea lions start splashing out of the water and clawing and, and splashing back into the water. And a couple of, a couple of characters did take a little bit of damage, nothing major from this. Um, and then they got a really good look at the sea lions and the sea lions are pretty disgusting. They're, they're these crazy lizard, awful looking things from a distance. They kind of look like a cross between like a seal and an actual lion, but up close they're like these awful yucky reptilian things that are just nasty. There's only anything to do with them. Um, so they kind of maybe remind me a little bit of the, of the mermen or mermaid things from cabin in the woods that were just office awful and horrendous, but not, not exactly. But, but anyway, I, I th that was just a little touch that I threw in there. Uh, another thing that happened was one of the characters, I think cast slow on the mana cores and also because of the, the spherical nature of the slow spell, I gave them a chance to catch a couple of the sea lions, depending on where the sea lions were. And just by the numbers they caught by pure, I think I gave a 50% chance for two of them to be caught in it. Right. Just by how they're swimming around. Cause I didn't know that I didn't have their exact locations marked and we rolled 50% twice percentile dice twice and both of them happen to get affected by the slow spell so i ruled that well because they're slowed they can't do the swimming leap but the two you know two of them were just normal and they did the swimming leap and did a couple of attacks just to kind of add some excitement and drama now uh the bard cast spider climb to go up it's go up his glass wall everybody else is doing ropes and stuff and he said you know i, I want to go get the sorcerer up at the top. So he's, I, I just said, well, since you have spider climb, I'm not going to make you roll. You can just go to the top. Or I think I let him go with advantage on climbing the ropes. I'm pretty sure that's what I did. Uh, either way, he made it up the top. And then he cast spider climb on the sorcerer. And so they both, I'm pretty sure, I, I either said you could just do it or I gave them advantage, but either way, they, they made it very easily back. So they're all on, the floor, the bottom tier now, and they dispelled the darkness. And the manticores are like, like manticore McNuggets. I mean, they're like smoking, steaming piles of grilled. I mean, they blasted these manticores. They threw at least one, if not two fireballs into the mix after the manticores were already dead. I mean, they blew these manticores away. It kind of reminded me of, um, at the end of the old Dragon Slayer movie from the 80s, after they blow up the dragon and there's all these smoking chunks of dragon, you know, and all the villagers are looking, you know, it's, I mean, there was, it was, it was Manticore McNuggets. Go get your Manticore McNuggets limited time only um, at, at your local Forgotten Realm McDonald's. I mean, they blasted these things into an oblivion. So once, once they get down there, they find that there's a door underneath like on that level and when you open that door and they check it for traps and all that and it's fine and they go in they open the door no problem there's another little corridor that goes down let's see here and it's underneath the, all the other levels right you're right they're actually kind of going underneath these other terraced levels and it goes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet into another door. And they can check that door. And again, there's no traps or anything like that, but they're checking. Now, we're still doing, I think it's a DC 15 strength check. 
to open these doors. And there's still just by sheer dice rolling, the weak, you know, magic using characters or whatever are the ones popping these doors open. And the uh, characters, you know, are I can't get them open. It's just it's the weirdest thing uh, that this is keeps being a trend. I think the rogue did manage to open one and was all proud of himself. But for the most part, the dice are, are mocking um, my player characters that, that should be, you know, there's a big strong guy, so I would keep you around, open that door. You know, they can't open it. And then a little gnome comes over and pops it open with a little, you know, elf or whatever. So these are the same doors that we mentioned last video, that if you break the glass walls and water starts pouring in, that these walls of force will come up over these doors until the water level is down to a certain amount. And then the, and then the walls of force will go away. But anyway, so they went down and they threw open the door. Um, you know, after much, what do we do this, that, and then they just threw open the door and here's what they see. Lavish furnishings and decorations are everywhere in this large room. The floor is strewn with rugs and cushions and tapestries cover the walls. A hookah, as tall as an adult human, stands in one corner. The largest piece of furniture is a sumptuous divan, like a big couch thing. So I, I kind of describe this as like in a sultan's palace. This is luxury, right? This is um, this is luxurious. It's you know it's it's decadent almost. And in there, there is an oni, O N I. Uh, which is a very powerful type of creature, uh, who lost a bet with Caraptus and as a result must confine himself in these luxurious surroundings guarding the treasure for 1,001 years. This treasure includes Black Razor. So uh, there's a magic mouth spell that will warn him of the approach of tra trespassers. So before they can get the door open, he will disguise himself using chain shape ability to take the form of a doughty halfling warrior claiming to be someone who has been trapped by the evil wizard. So they throw open the door and, you know, they're expecting like ah, black razor, but instead they see these, this ornately furnished, luxurious, whatever decadent room. And this halfling warrior is like, Oh, thank goodness you're here. And that's exactly where we ended things. And they're like, what? You're not black. Razor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, they're like, they were totally dumbfounded by this. Um, now, Black Razor is, there's some very good treasure in this room, up to and including Black Razor. Uh, and there's uh, this this Oni named Questniff uh, is, is, I'm just going to play it like he will fight to protect his treasure because, you know, he lost a bet with Kraptus and he's, he's guarding the treasure. So unless the character has come up with a very very clever approach they're gonna fight this oni and i went and looked the oni up and the oni's pretty tough we'll talk about that more next video but that's where we ended things and i love the end because the characters are like they're assuming by their own conversation i didn't say anything i was just packing them they're talking that this halfling warrior is a survivor of a previous expedition who's been trapped here that's how they're interpreting this so which was probably what the designer intended so let me go over the notes see if i forgot anything else uh, let's see here. Yep. Went through that it's fireballs. Oh, one thing I had to keep reminding the party of how this terraced aquarium looks. Cause it can be a really confusing, uh, room to understand the layout and how everything is. And sure enough, you know, especially cause we missed a week. Uh, in between, they were, they were, you know, even though they had mapped it, we described it, showed them pictures. I had to describe it a few more times and show them pictures again to, to help them understand. Cause there was like, well, we're on this level. So what's there? Da, da, da. My guess is every party that goes through this has the same thing because it's an odd spatial setup of how everything relates to everything else. And I mean, as DM, I get it because I studied it and I've got it right in front of me and everything. But if you don't have a constant reference in front of you, even though I mapped it for them and they could see it and everything, it's still, you know, there's there's a three dimensional aspect to it. So that's one thing I, I really wanted to point out here. Uh, you know, you may have to do that. And I mean, keep in mind, 
the session where they first encountered the room, I spent a lot of time describing it. We probably spent about 10 minutes on the description and mapping it and drawing it and showing them stuff to help them understand. So try not to get frustrated with your players if they're if they just if they keep asking now what how does this work and everything. Uh, so see if there's anything else here. Uh, oh, one thing they told me, and I believed them, because uh, the way they said it, you know, I didn't I didn't feel that there was any, you know, deception going on. They had cast uh, water breathing on the party before they did all this, so in case they had you know, falling into the water or something like that. They, they were, they had water breathing covered and, and they were like, and you know, the way they said it to me, I, I was like, okay. I mean, I honestly felt like it was an, uh, something I failed to remember that they had told me. What's interesting to me that they didn't do is they have a potion of animal friendship and a ring of animal friendship that they didn't use in uh, so far in this area. And I really thought that they would. I thought that was kind of interesting. That's some of the random treasure that we rolled for them right before the uh, adventure to began. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, yeah, I think everything else I've talked about. Um, yeah, here's my note. I gave I gave advantage on, on the ropes with the spider climb. So I think I covered everything else. Uh, next, they'll, you know, next session, they will confront the Oni named Kwesnif, hopefully get Black Razor. Now this 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 Oni O N I you know I looked at the stats as no slouch I think it's a CR seven creature monster opponent so we'll see what happens but anyway as always thanks for watching still having a great time with White Plume Mountain as are my players so I hope that um, you're enjoying this video series please leave a thumbs up maybe a comment on this video if you would that helps me out tremendously. And if you haven't already, maybe subscribe to the channel. I, I try to make interesting content, D&D &D and otherwise, for your viewing pleasure. Anyway, we will catch you next time on Shane Plays, and thanks again for watching.